show. Great to be here. We are so excited. We're talking today to Glenn Greenwald. Not a big deal at all. Just one of the kind of coolest journalists out there. He is the founder of The Intercept, and we've had great Intercept journalist guests on the show before, like Lee Fong, Rania Kalik, who writes there occasionally, and Zed Jelani. Hello. Hi, this is Katie Halper. Hey, Katie, Glenn Greenwald, how are you? Oh, good, you? Yeah, that was my Brazilian I, hello, yeah. sorry. No, thank you, thank you, that was so exciting. Um, yeah. It was very international. Yeah, thank you. I was. Uh, I thought maybe there was someone, like a, a Brazilian security clearance or something. <laughs> they were going no, to. he's off. Oh, good, okay. Well, I'm. we are so excited to speak to you. Um, I'm here with my co-host, Gabe Pacheco. Hello. Hey, Gabe. There's so much that we could talk about with you. One of the fa- my favorite things talking about uh, with you on Twitter is how amazingly effective uh, alleged Cl- Hillary Clinton fans are at alienating the very people they claim they need to convince to vote for her. And, you know, you would think, because these people constantly talk about how Donald Trump is representing a real fascist threat, you would think that these people would want to actually convince people. But there's something much more satisfying about kind of just railing against people. And again, it's ironic to me, at least, because one of the biggest complaints about people who are considering voting for a third party is that they're self-indulgent. And to me, there's nothing more self-indulgent than ranting against these people instead of trying to convince them. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Right. Well, first of all, this you view that Donald Trump poses this unprecedented and existential threat to American values and the liberal order and and democracy was actually a reason that a lot of people were trying to uh, sound the alarm during the primary that Hillary Clinton was an extremely weak and unpopular and um, highly vulnerable candidate precisely because people were so worried that she was probably the only human being on the planet who could actually lose to Donald Trump in the election. And the very same Democratic partisans are now trying to beat browbeat everybody um, into falling in line on the grounds that Trump is this existential threat, where the same people who so steadfastly ignored all of the data um, and kept insisting that it didn't matter that Sanders was running ahead in every poll as compared to Clinton against Trump, or that Hillary Clinton was one of the most unpopular potential nominees in in decades, they were dead set on nominating her, regardless of whether or not it would help Trump win the election. And so there's a lot of tension to begin with between um, their depictions of him in in this extremist way and, and their actual behavior during the primary, they were very much not looking for the candidate most likely to win. They were looking for the candidate um, that they liked best. And the second part of it is exactly what you just said, which is there are these groups of disaffected potential Democratic voters that Hillary Clinton desperately needs either to vote for her instead of another candidate or to care enough and be enthusiastic enough to go to the polls. Um, and the message to them seems to be, in contrast to the message to say, moderate Republican suburban voters, which is we're very proud of, you know, Brent Scowcroft and George H.W. Bush and all of these Republicans who are endorsing us. And we want to emphasize to you all of the ways in which we're ideologically compatible with you. The message to these disaffected people on the left seems to be you are narcissistic and racist and misogynistic and selfish and abusive um, and have very little understanding of the political system and very and even less value to contribute to it. And now we need you to do what we tell you to do and support um, Hillary Clinton. And and I think you're exactly right. If they really do view Donald threat as Donald Trump as this towering threat, as they claim, they ought to be thinking a lot more about how to persuade people to vote for her. But they they have this entitlement that people just ought to, as their civic duty, vote for her without needing for her to persuade them to do so. And I think that has alienated a lot of uh, potential votes. Right. It's like, why won't you listen to us, you idiotic pieces of crap? We're trying to right. talk to you. Right. About and where... all of your concerns are invalid and, yeah. and, and, and self-centered and self-absorbed. And we have no interest in addressing your grievances or assuaging your concerns about the ideology or policies of the party that we demand you vote for. Right. Again, it's like their their premise is that Donald Trump is this fascistic threat. Right. It's like whether or not that's true. And we can say that's true just for argument's sake. Again, 
is there some historical precedent that we're not aware of where where the fight against fascism required mocking potential allies and supporters? Well, there's a weird psychology to it, too, I think, which is it's often the case that in primaries, the various camps competing with one another for the nomination um, can often be more viciously hostile than they even get once they get the nomination in the art of the opposing party, because a lot of times people within the same camp um, don't have a lot much to fight about, although I think there was a lot being fought over here. But in general, you can, over small things, actually fight more viciously. Um, and there's a sort of sense that people are traitors to right. the cause or whatever. Um, but usually once one of the factions wins, they're like, they triumph, they're victorious, they get their way, their candidate ends up as the nominee. They tend to be generous toward the people they've vanquished, and they want to do outreach, and they want to, you know, assuage hard feelings, and they want to persuade the people who are kind of alienated and, and disappointed with the process um, that their views matter too, that this is a party that's intending to represent their interests also. And in this case, for whatever reason, and it's obviously not the case for all, but we're speaking generally. Um, I think the dominant Clinton supporters in the media certainly have taken the opposite tack, which is winning has almost made them even more kind of hostile and resentful at having been challenged or questioned in the first place. And the fact that they ended up winning vindicated their sense of superiority in a way that they want not to persuade, but almost to demand some sort of repentance, some kind of like, I don't know, almost like, you know, a, a carousing general who has conquered land once you know, the, the tribal leader to kneel before the, the victorious force um, in a way that has, I think, even, you know, exacerbated these tensions even further. Right. So I have a question about that. What is leading to this sort of tone deaf uh, uh, sense of entitlement that's coming from the Clinton camp? Are they not? Uh, don't they have, you know, uh, I guess boots on the ground? Aren't they? Don't they have their feelers out to see sort of what the temperature is, um, you know, among younger voters? And I like I because I just can't wrap my head around how they can be so tone deaf. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, you know, I think that there is a pervasive contempt for the left, like mm. a view that the left is not worth taking seriously in any way, that they're not um, credible players in the game. Um, and I think if you look to the UK, you can see this dynamic really clearly because there the left actually triumphed. I mean, the Corbyn faction has taken hold of Tony Blair's Labour Party and in the process has driven the centrist and the establishmentarians who have controlled that party for decades completely insane. I mean, they're literally ready to just fracture the party and break it apart and hand power um, in the next election over to the Tories just in order to prove a point or to stomp their feet because they're so offended that their respectable party has been taken over by these, you know, heathens, these people who don't deserve any kind of attention or respect. And I think you see exactly that same dynamic playing out in the Democratic Party where Hillary Clinton, before a single vote was cast, was going to be the nominee. She was the entitled, presumptive nominee. Nobody had any doubts she was going to march straight into the convention as the unchallenged um, nominee of the Democratic Party. And there was, they were okay with having some jokey token oppositions, like they thought Sanders was really cute in the beginning, like he was going to be the kind of like old, cantankerous socialist who reminded you of, you know, this kind of like, um, 1960s part of the Democratic Party that you can kind of pat on the head condescendingly. Right, who doesn't um, live in the real world. Give a little praise to, and then it kind of just like gets destroyed by this, you know, Clinton machine, and then it falls into line and endorses her and, you know, the kind of like gray-haired ponytail people <laughs> and the idealistic naive students get led back into the Hillary camp by, by Bernie. Um and the fact that he posed such an overwhelming threat to her, that they were seriously worried about her losing to him, um, that he raised so much money, generated so much enthusiasm, produced so many large crowds, forced all these issues into the party. I think they're really angry about it because they feel like it was just it, there was no license for it. They feel like they were challenged by people 
who had no authority to challenge them, and they're still really furious and off- about it and offended by it. Um, and I think that's still playing out, that dynamic. And do you think that there's any fear that um, – do you think any of this is kind of preemptive and that there's a fear that Hillary Clinton won't win? So they're kind of starting to lay out the narrative that it's the fault of millennials, it's the fault of self-indulgent people who won't care enough to get out and vote, third-party supporters, et cetera, so that if she doesn't win, they'll have their, their bases or their, their butts covered? Yes. I mean, although I do have to say, I think that's a very common dynamic in all elections. I think you see the same thing going on on the Republican side, where the people who hate Donald Trump, of course, are ready to blame those who nominated him when they lose. If they lose, the people who are supportive of Trump are wanting to blame the Republicans who refuse to get behind him. So there's a war over who will be most culpable. Um, I remember in 2004, when John Kerry lost, the um, you know, centrists and conservatives in that party said that they had nominated this liberal senator from Massachusetts, and that was why they lost. They have to nominate a more right-wing candidate they want to win. And liberals in the party said, you know, you nominated this person who presented himself as this, like, war hero, um, who instead of nominating Howard Dean, who at the time was the ideological standard bearer of the left, you hired this, like, wishy-washy person who everybody could see was an opportunist, opportunist with who stood for nothing, and that was why he lost. So there's always this, you know, kind of maneuvering to assign blame. But in this particular case, what's so striking about it is, as I said earlier, they knowingly nominated somebody who a huge portion of the country just irredeemably hates, whose disapproval ratings were extremely high, who has been around forever and about whom negative attitudes are very entrenched, who has the stench of multiple ethical um, uh, quandaries and 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 um, controversies hovering over her, all this Wall Street money. It was all so predictable, and they did it anyway, knowing that it was so obviously that she was going to deeply struggle. And now that she's struggling the way that it was so obvious she would, they want to blame everyone else. You know, the media, uh, millennials, third party voters, Jill Stein, um, Bernie supporters for having torn her down. Um, They want to blame everyone but themselves, even though they bear responsibility primarily for being the cause of her nomination, despite all the evidence that she would be very vulnerable. One of my favorite recent examples of this is, of course, um, Clara Jeffrey from Mother Jones. And I just would like to say I'm very glad that Mother Jones is not alive to see this. But um, she wrote something about... It's like one of the things that makes me really hope there's no afterlife so that she doesn't have to watch it from wherever she is. Exactly. Right, exactly. Like, if there's a God, he would undo the afterlife. Um, Just to spare her. Exactly, yeah. Um, that's a, I really, that's a good, that's another, another reason that, uh, we don't believe that I don't want to believe in God. Um, sometimes I wish I did, but anyway, we'll get to that later. But, um, Mojo's We're gonna ed- get to immortality and life after death a little later on. Totally. Yeah. We got to okay. work our way into it. This is actually, this is kind of like a Tony Robbins. Is that his name? This well, is- you know, there's a, there's a new app right now out. I read in the New York times today about in, in Amazon, uh, the kid will send you a Buddhist monk. If you want one, you can. It's like an Uber for uh, for spiritual guidance. Aww. So we're getting close to commodifying that too. Yeah, good, that's, good. Yeah. that's great. We're a little, yeah, it's a little overdue. Yeah. So, so let's get back back to um, Bash and Clara. Oh Jeffrey, yeah, definitely. Let's do that. I really enjoy that. Yeah, it's so it's so great. It's so cathartic. So Clara Jeffrey at Mother Jones uh, tweeted that she'd never hated millennials more, and she linked to an article that uh, was about. You know, millennials not being excited enough about Clinton. Of course, as other people pointed out, her her age group is is worse than millennials are. But they're behind Trump. In what? They're behind Trump. Yeah, exactly. But again, this has never been really about accuracy. This has been so much more about emotion than you know the truth. Like you you were saying before, if people really cared about having a a, be, a less vulnerable candidate, they would have entertained Bernie Sanders more. But again, this is about some weird emotional investment. So Clara writes that, and then um, Kevin Drum, who is I think some of these people, by the way, have real crushes on Bernie Sanders because I don't know why. How else to explain the kind of obsession with them, uh, with him? It reminds me of that magnetic field song. I don't know if you guys know that, but I don't want to get over you. I don't want to get over. I could take a sleeping pill and sleep back well, and I'll have to go through what I... That, 
I feel like is the theme yeah, song. He, he, lost, he lost. He conceded defeat. He endorsed yeah. Lord Clinton. He was now on the campaign trail, like genuinely campaigning for her. Yeah. Crafting he... messages at his supporters to guilt them into voting for her. And they can't stop their obsessive negativity. About right. It's... He, yeah, you got a beach house, too, which kind of like, you know. Oh yeah, well that, that was. A... Did you see that crappy beach house? Yeah, I know. Seriously, it's like <laughs> a shack. It sounded like it was this palatial estate <laughs> on the Pacific Ocean. Right, um, but the the other thing is that, um, yeah, I mean, I I feel like it's kind of like you know when someone breaks up with someone or it gets dumped and they're like, I'm so over it. I don't think about him ever. He's totally not in my mind. Can, let's talk about how much I really don't care about him. Like he totally doesn't matter. That's the kind of thing I feel like is coming from Kevin Drum at all. And so what he does, Kevin Drum, is that he writes a very persuasive piece called Don't Hate Millennials, Save It for Bernie Sanders, which is great because that's how you're going to definitely convince people who like Bernie Sanders by telling them that he's an odious person. Um, yeah, who's to blame for like, – what, what do they think happens in elections? I mean also both of them, Clara Jeffrey and – Kevin mm-hmm. Drum, I, I know this because I, I remember it, were around for the 2008 primary between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, which was a many magnitudes nastier and more just personality destructive than the one between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, which was actually quite tame by comparison, right. even compared to other primary contests, let alone the one in 2008. But the 2008 was probably like one of the nastiest campaigns I've ever seen. Um you know, I mean, she was sending uh, that picture of Obama in the Muslim garb right. in Indonesia to the Judge Report. Right, and um, she, and then Clinton, of course, said that they were playing the race card after he compared him to uh, Jesse Jackson Jesse and Jackson. Obama. Right, and then she yeah. said the thing and, about white workers and uh, yeah, 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 exactly, all that. I mean, it was it was racist and it was nasty right. and it was just so spiteful and totally. You know, they didn't want to concede defeat for right. months and um, and then the RFK the assassination Alpuma. reminder. Yeah. So the, they, I mean, they they seem to be resentful over the fact that when Bernie Sanders ran against Hillary Clinton, he critiqued her policy positions and ethical choices, as though that's improper. And that was what I that's what I'm getting what what I was getting back to earlier was they genuinely believe that he had no entitlement to do that because the left is inferior and has no standing to challenge someone as, as kind of important and superior as Hillary Clinton. I mean, that's the only way you can regard anything he did as illegitimate. Right. Um, given how she campaigned against Obama in 2008. Right. And I, I would say to people, what is Bernie Sanders doing that's so offensive? He's critiquing her policies. And so some of the people I would say this to would say, yeah, he's undermining her integrity. Um, okay. Well, I mean, he, you know, in fairness, I mean, he did raise ethical questions about her behavior. He did talk about all the Wall Street money she got and pressed her to release the transcripts of her, her speeches that she gave to Goldman Sachs and and and, um, and Citigroup for many hundreds of thousands of dollars and talked about the millions of dollars she receives from Wall Street and big corporate donors and the bidding that she's done right. on their behalf and on behalf of regimes in the Middle East that are extremely oppressive and brutal. Those are ethical questions totally appropriate to raise. Right. Um, like he should have just – should he have just thrown like self-sabotage his entire campaign? Maybe that would have been how he would have avoided being sexist and undermining her, her integrity. And he could have gone further. He said forget about the damn emails. He barely touched the foundation stuff until well, he was asked. Right. I mean, and he actually did her a disservice by ignoring those issues because the reason that they've been so explosive in the last two months um, to Trump's benefit – is precisely because they weren't litigated during the primary, which totally. is normally when candidates get vetted, because Bernie dislikes that kind of attack and, and prefers not – he wanted to talk about you know, trade and, and, and Wall Street and not her emails and, and the Clinton Foundation because that's just instinctively what he's always done with his political career. And as a result, um, she wasn't tested on those issues and, and was, as a result was more vulnerable to them when they got raised during the general election. Right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, that's the, the irony. Yeah, exactly. The vetting process that could have, or or this like kind of uh, the drill or the the strength training that could have happened didn't because of that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Snowden and 
I, I'm I'm kind of shocked, but I guess I shouldn't be. But of course, you wrote a great article at the Intercept about how the Washington Post actually came out and wrote an op-ed against pardoning Snowden. Um, I'm really shocked anytime someone actually calls Edward Snowden a traitor. I'm 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 not shocked that people think it or say it in private. I find it shocking that so many liberals actually say it on Twitter and out loud. But this Washington Post uh, op-ed was so interesting because as you point out in your piece called Washington, Wash Post makes history first paper to call for prosecution of its own source after accepting Pulitzer. Um, what's going on here, do you think? Well, first of all, I mean, there's a partisan component to the reaction to Snowden um, that you alluded to, which is, you know, when I was growing up, um, I remembered that liberals used to regard Daniel Ellsberg as this great heroic figure. Um, Dan Ellsberg himself was the first one to say that what he and Snowden did were identical. He's become Snowden's most advocate, uh, most vocal advocate. And so the question becomes, why do liberals love Daniel Ellsberg and hate Edward Snowden? Of course, the reason is because Daniel Ellsberg's leaks occurred during the Republican administration and Edward Snowden's occurred during a Democratic one. And, you know, I have always said that if Edward Snowden had been Edward Snowden during the Bush administration, there would be a 30-foot high marble statue of him erected outside of the MSNBC headquarters right. of 30 Rock. Um, right. But, you know, that's not the world in which you live. But I think the broader point about the media, you know, one of the things that amazed me um, really from the start of the Snowden reporting was the willingness of a lot of journalists to be so openly um, in support of the government and so opposed to the acts of journalism we were doing and um, the transparency we were bringing and in particular um, Edward Snowden's decision to serve as a source because you would think that anybody who goes into the field of journalism who makes that choice at some point in their lives regards transparency and sources and reporting and shining a light on the most secret aspects of the government to be good things. Like just in theory, abstractly, intuitively, you would think that journalists would do that. And, you know, from the beginning, the most virulent attackers, um, not just of Snowden, but also of me and the other journalists who were working on the story came from media figures. I mean, they went on Meet the Press and David Gregory all but demanded that I, you know, be arrested and hauled off to prison. Um, Andrew Ross Sorkin, who's, you know, the Wall Street reporter for the, the New York Times, literally express, explicitly on his show said that I ought to be arrested. Um, and that kept happening. And, you know, there were more journalists who were supportive, um, but it quickly became apparent to me that there's a lot of um, journalists, which I've already known and had been writing about for years, but I saw it viscerally, who do regard themselves first and foremost as nationalists, as agents of the state, um, who before they – you know, prioritize um, values of transparency or reporting or journalism value subservience to those who wield political power. And so in one sense, what the Washington Post did is to be completely expected because the Washington Post op-ed editorial page for many years has been kind of the belly of the beast of D.C. conventional wisdom and status quo safeguarding, um, ultimate subservience to the national security state and the intelligence community. They support every war. They support every expansion of executive power. So it's not really surprising in that regard to see them siding with the NSA and the U.S. government and the Justice Department, even calling for the prosecution of a source. What made it so remarkable is that in this particular case, it just so happens that that source whose prosecution they're advocating happens to be one of the most important sources in that newspaper's history. Um, it's a source whose documents enabled them to win a Pulitzer Prize. And the, they, they actually went out of their way to explicitly attack stories that the Post itself not only published and reported, but won the Pulitzer for reporting, um, including the prison program, which they said was not only not in the public interest to expose, but they said it actually endangered national security by reporting it, which means they're not really – just criticizing Edward Snowden, they're also implicitly, they didn't have the courage to do it explicitly, but they're implicitly criticizing their newspaper and their own top editors, um, who are the ones who made the decision to publish that. And, you know, in one sense, it is remarkable for the reasons I wrote, but the very next day, a reporter for the New York Times, um, Nicole Perloff, uh, went on Twitter and, and, and she 
was one of the reporters at the New York Times who worked on the part of the archive that they received, and she said she agreed with what the New York, the Washington Post said and also believed Snowden ought to be held criminally liable or prosecuted or put on trial. Um, that's someone who's a reporter, a national security reporter at the New York Times with a history of that paper of being persecuted by the government, of having the government go after their sources and their reporters. That paper has gone to the Supreme Court for the right to publish government secrets, and it's just a sign of what they've become that you have one of their reporters standing up in public and calling for the criminal prosecution of a source who has shined more light on government institutions, well, not more, but as much as, as any other source, um, and who was a source for some of the reporting she was able to do. It's, it's just kind of a reflection of how subservient American journalism mm-hmm. has become to the U.S. government. Right. I mean, shouldn't the Post then give back its Pulitzer, and shouldn't they discipline their, their journalists, and, and shouldn't this woman at the New York Times do that too? I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. Right. I mean, in fairness, the editorial page of the Post is separate from the news part of the Post, except that right at the top of every editorial, it says the Post's view. So the editorial page is sanctioned to speak on behalf of the Washington Post. It opines and expresses positions that are ultimately attributed to the Washington Post. So when they endorse Hillary Clinton, other news outlets will report it as the Washington Post endorses Hillary Clinton. So they are authorized to speak on behalf of the paper. Uh, But at least in that case, there is this distinction between the editorial page that's saying that Snowden ought to be prosecuted because nothing he did or almost nothing he did was in the public's interest and the news division that has defended the reporting and made the decision to publish it. On some level, I almost find what this New York Times reporter said more disturbing because she actually is in the news part of the newspaper. She is entrusted to make judgments about what ought to be um, publicized, and she is echoing that view. And what's really fascinating about it is that when Snowden came to to me and Laura Poitras, um, very unconventional choices. If you're a big whistleblower with lots of national security secrets, typically you would go to the New York Times or the Post. He was adamant that the New York Times not have anything to do with the reporting. And that was because he believed, based on its history, that the New York Times was far too uh, – that it identified far too much of the national security agencies of the U.S. government, that it would suppress the material, that he couldn't trust them. And it's amazing how vindicated he ended up being in that view – that although there's a lot of reporters at the New York Times who defend him and defend what he did and certainly don't share this view, this reporter feels comfortable in public um, calling for his prosecution, even though she herself worked on those very documents. Right. How does she sleep at night? I mean, I guess she probably sleeps well because (laughs) she views herself as on the side of good, and that good is the U.S. government. Um, And that's obviously a very problematic perspective to have if you're a journalist reporting on that government because you're supposed to be adversarial to it, not worshipful of it. Right. If if she believed the, that uh, what she was disclosing were national security secrets that were dangerous, though, I mean, shouldn't she have gone directly to the NSA with this uh, leaked information rather than distribute it out? I mean, is she prosecutable as well under the same guidelines that that? So a couple would things be? about that. That's, that's really interesting. Um, you guys may know the story of the um, radicals who actually weren't radicals but were just sort of ordinary people working as like taxi drivers and school teachers who broke into the FBI office in uh, Medina, Pennsylvania in 1971 um, and exposed the COINTEL program. Right. Um, you know, protesters had long suspected the FBI was infiltrating their movement and doing a bunch of other untoward things, but they could never prove it. So they broke into the FBI office, an incredibly courageous thing to do, and found the files which um, prove this. And the first thing that they did was they sent it um, to the Washington Post, which um, turned around. You know, I think I might be getting the details wrong about which news organization. It might have been the New York Times, so I want to be careful. But the first organiz- news organization that they sent it to got got the files, turned around, called the FBI, and said, someone sent us your secret documents and gave it back to the FBI. Um, and then it was one of the other news organizations that they then sent it to that ultimately reported it. So, we, you know, it's, it's funny that we can sort of say that in jazz. 
But that actually has been something that news organizations in the past have done, and that was actually something Snowden was very worried about, that the New York Times would publish one or two stories and then give the rest of the archive back to the U.S. government or just suppress it. Um, but the other aspect of it is that's so ironic, and this is really ironic, is one of the the main critique against Snowden in establishment circles, so this is what the Washington Post editorial page has said, Fred Kaplan at Slate says this, anyone who wants to avoid being just a right-wing fanatic who says all, all disclosures of secrets are bad, who wants to like appear to be reasonable but at the same time be a Snowden critic, has settled on this line, which is – some of what he – a tiny portion of what he disclosed should have been disclosed, the domestic metadata program. But there were all these other programs about how the NSA spies on foreign countries and in, in, on foreign in, in, in intelligence operations overseas that he also leaked, and those things should never have been publicly revealed. And the irony of it is that when they list the things that got revealed that they think should not have been revealed, the majority of those stories – were stories published not by me or Laura Poitras or by The Guardian or by The Intercept or Der Spiegel, but by The Washington Post and The New York Times, particularly The New York Times. And in fact, one of the stories, the story that was probably most controversial, was that, that even Snowden had qualms about and that I had qualms about, was them reporting, The New York Times reporting, how the NSA spies on the Chinese state-owned company Huawei, and it talked about all the different ways that the NSA had infiltrated Chinese technological infrastructure. That was the New York Times who chose to report that. And what was amazing to me about this, that when I went and looked at that yesterday after I saw Nicole Perloff saying what she was saying on Twitter, was that she was the one who wrote that story, who made the choice to disclose those documents. So at the very same time that she's saying that she thinks Snowden should be held criminally responsible because, as the Washington Post said, he leaked documents that weren't just about privacy but also foreign intelligence operations. She was the one at the New York Times who made the choice to publish one of the most sensitive of any of the secrets that ended up get, getting published. So I do think it's actually a good question. If she thinks Snowden ought to be prosecuted, why shouldn't she be? Maybe we should start a campaign against her. Like instead- Yeah, we should call the Justice Department. Yeah. We could have it as like so. While there's this pardon Snowden campaign, we could make it the what like like prosecute hypocrisy campaign. Well, you actually, what the, I think what the campaign should be is to take take you know. Do you guys? I don't know. You might be too young to remember Liquid Paper. Um, Heard of but it? It's a thing that like you used to white over mistakes. So you could take the indictment and just Liquid Paper out the name Edward Snowden under over the espionage counts and replace her name on the indictment. We should totally do that. That would be great, actually, if we just and if you could take the article that she wrote or the article the Washington Post wrote and just kind of put her name in it too, uh, kind of like a Mad Libs. Ad right. Libs? I mean, I'm sure if she were here, or she probably wouldn't say this because I don't think she quite thinks this in in such a sophisticated way. But if other people uh, who understood these issues were here, they would say, of course, Snowden can be prosecuted. Um, under the Espionage Act, but she can't be because she's a journalist and has First Amendment protections. But the reality is that issue has never been adjudicated. Um, journalists don't have any special standing under the law. So if it's illegal for Snowden to publicize or leak top secret material, it's also illegal for Nicole Perlroth to do it under the Espionage Act. The only argument she would have that he wouldn't have is as a journalist, she has the First Amendment mm-hmm. right, and it's against the First Amendment to prosecute her under that. But the courts have never actually decided that. So she does have serious criminal exposure, and it's really bizarre to watch a journalist construct a theory that justifies the prosecution of behavior that the journalist herself engaged in. I'm telling you, it's guilt. It has to be some subconscious guilt or, like, masochism. What, is she Catholic or Jewish? We'll figure it out. Jewish, right? <laughs> Let's do an investigation of that as well. Totally, yeah. we got to do that. So, Glenn, I have a question for you. Um, this is kind of a personal question, but which do you identify with the most? Which do you think describes you best? Being a Trump enabler and fan of Trump, being a sexist, misogynist, uh, Hillary hater, or being a self-loathing Jew? I think you'd have to go with Hitler admirer. Oh, Hitler admirer. Okay, sorry. I should have. Yeah, I, I, I just. I list, really I put you into a. Two, I made you way too too. Dem- 
uh, two dimensional. I'm one dimensional. Sorry. So you, you're being very generous with your choices. Oh, thank you. I try to be. I mean, you're so, it's it's hard to encapsulate you because you are so your crimes are so varied. But in a they're, way, it's, they're so vast. They're so vast, right? But it's kind of nice. I mean, the, the nice thing about the Washington Post, and this relates to to all the attacks you get, is, I mean, it's always flattering when the source that calls you self loathing Jew does that, right? Because if you were kind of if the Israeli government or if if really hawkish Zionists praise you, you'd be doing something wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, I try and tell like whenever journalism students when I speak to journalism schools or or whatever, you know, and they say, "Oh, what bit of advice would you give?" which is a really weird position to find yourself when you're like, "Oh my god, I'm so old that like now college students are saying like, no. "Hey, old man, like looking back on your long life, like what advice do you have to give us?" But anyway, that's what happened. Liquid to me. paper. Do you have liquid liquid paper advice? <laughs> right, like How to store paper. it? Have <laughs> you ever heard of liquid paper? I heard it was something that like people in your generation used like exactly. many many decades ago. Um, but anyway, what, what I always say is like, you need to be prepared to be hated. Mm. Um, you know, in part because, uh, if, if the idea of journalism is to be adversarial to those who wield power, the nature of people having power is that they can act against those who impede them in any way. Um, but the bigger part of it is, is that, you know, one of the things I've come to really understand well is that politics is, is, is a struggle for power. Um, and it's necessarily tribalistic. And if you're promoting a certain view or defending a certain outcome, you're necessarily at odds with somebody else's agenda or their desired outcome. And they're going to dislike you for it and hate you for it and want to attack you for it. And the more effective you are, the more they're going to hate you and want to attack you to render you less effective. And you just can't take that personally. Right. Um, you know, you want to find this right balance between being open to good faith critiques of people who are voicing valid criticisms of you that you can take into account and adjust and modify your behavior. Um, but distinguishing that between between that and, and people who are attacking you for the reasons that I've just described. And so I did, I have come to learn that when the right people are attacking you and hating you, um, it's a vindication of the efficacy of your work. Right. It's a great, it's like a blurb or an endorsement. Yeah, you want to have like a good uh, gallery of villains. Exactly. That are uh, in opposition to you. Right. I mean, that, exactly. that's what's great about the Washington Post thing is that, you know, it's a Washington Post because it's been so, it, it's been so like shamelessly awful this election cycle, especially. Um, you know, their their amazing back to back slamming of of Sanders in a, in such an overt way and then their really shocking uh anti Maya culpa, Maya no culpa, where where they were like, Well, we investigated our own newspaper and we determined that we're not biased against Bernie Sanders. So in a way, you know, I would be freaked out if if I were Edward Snowden or you who had worked on this issue so much, it would be a scary thing if they were like, Yeah, he should totally be pardoned. The other nice thing about the op ed is it's so terribly written. And it's so terribly argued. I mean, it's so flimsy that, again, it's probably one of the best pieces of um, journalism in favor of pardoning Snowden. Yeah, you know, we've had like a, a lot of luck in the whole three years of the Snowden controversy of having really well-chosen enemies. Um, I mean, literally, if you're going to have, you know, if you get to pick the representative of like media malice and stupidity, um, you couldn't pick a better adversary than David Gregory. Right. Um, and, you know, it's just like kind of been down the line that way where we've been really fortunate that the people who have been most vocal in attacking us have been people that nobody would ever want to align themselves with. And, I mean, the Washington Post editorial page literally is, 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 is you know, kind of the epitome of Washington evil. And I wrote this in my book long before this editorial, and I've written about it for many years like a lot of other people have. I mean, you go down the line, they've supported every war on terror excess. Um, they were behind every war. Um, there's no expansion of, of power and budgetary authority for the intelligence and national security community um, that they ever dislike. Um, they're just guardians of conventional wisdom. And, and yeah, I'd be very disturbed. But the funny thing about it is one of the reasons why early on we decided we wanted to involve the Washington Post and this reporting was exactly for this reason that we wanted to tie in one of Washington's most cherished and respected mainstream institutions into what it was that we were doing precisely because if it were just me and Laura Poitras out there kind of freelancing, 
it'd be really easy to say, oh, look, that's treason. But right. once the Washington Post was roped into it in the limited way that they were, it became much more difficult to say this isn't journalism, this is treason, because who wants to in Washington to be standing up and accusing the Washington Post of committing treason? But had the Washington Post not been involved in this reporting, that op-ed would have been much different. It would have said Edward Snowden is a traitor who ought to be executed and hung by a tree, right. and all those who collaborated with him ought to be right along with him. Um, so the only reason it was that conflicted and twisted and, and, and mild was because they knew that they were institutionally implicated in the thing they wanted to attack. Right. That's great. Very clever. Very great. Well, um, uh, last last thing, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton famously said that Edward Snowden should come back uh, and face the music. He broke the laws of the United States, stole very important information that has unfortunately uh, fallen into a lot of the wrong hands. I don't think he should be brought home without facing the music. So I was thinking of some great songs that that, of course, she she wouldn't agree with this, but I was trying to think of the best songs that the United States government could play if he were to come back. As he came back to face yeah. that music. Right. So I was thinking something like Sorry by Justin Bieber. Is it too late now to say sorry? Cause I'm missing more than just your body. I'm sorry, you know. I'm sorry. So sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Great theme. It's hard for me to say I'm sorry. Have any suggestions? We can do a playlist, actually. Well, I mean, I think. I think I mean I personally I think that Hillary would prefer the Justin Bieber song because she really is down with millennial culture. Totally. I, I don't know if you saw um yesterday or the day before, but she wrote an article about all the things she's learned from millennials, which is extremely sincere. Mm. <laughs> um, and she's also, you know, pioneered the use of like culturally hip memes. Mm. Um she's my she's abuelita. Really, yeah, she's really familiar and adept with all kinds of like apps um, and, you know, like all the things that young kids, I mean, she's all, but she's like young in spirit. She's really like a millennial. So I think that that would probably be her choice. Great. Well, then I'm glad we can agree, at least on like the first song when he comes back. That can be the first one. But I think you're right, Glenn. I think you really nailed it, which is that that is the song that most represents Hillary Clinton, how much she has her finger on the pulse of young millennial um, cool culture. So, well, Glenn, um, we are so happy to have talked to you. And this is I'm just going to explain because we're we're short on time. I'm going to do the intro and outro and stuff. And I'll praise you and say all the great stuff you do and, and like where people can I find you. That's my favorite part of the interview. Exactly. I know. So listeners don't know this, but Glenn actually sent me uh, a list of demands. And I have to spend the first <laughs> half of the hour of the show re- praising yeah, like a him. Hostage. Exactly. You have to read yeah. It word for word. Exactly. Um, but no, thank you so much. And we would love to have you on again and talk to you more. And if you're in New York, we'll try to harass you into into coming to the studio. Um, and really, you're you're so. I, I kind of feel like you're the Omar of journalism. You know Omar from from The Wire. Do you ever watch that show? Yes. Yes. Of course. So I feel like Omar has this kind of pansexual appeal where like no matter what someone's sexual orientation is no matter what their gender is i'm saying you could be anything from asexual to poly to whatever to queer to questioning i feel like everyone kind of has a crush on omar uh, i feel I, glenn i feel like you could you could survive a four-story fall out of a window just like omar that too you yeah know what? i am definitely accepting this this comparison right um yeah yeah um, yeah i think i think you nailed it i think so too that could that should be your twitter bio the omar of journalism but it's true i think you're just such a should i should i sweep out my picture and put michael k williams up uh yeah <laughs> out, of, 
Yeah, I, I do you think, think anyone so. find that objectionable at all? No, not at all. I don't think so. Not um, problematic. Not that. problematic at all. Not fetishizing. <laughs> or no one would have to interrogate it and really problematize the implications of that and the we'll, white privilege. We'll unpack that. Later. Well, um, yeah, we're totally going to unpack that later. <laughs> Um, but, all right, guys. Well, it was great speaking to yes, you. I really enjoyed it. You and, too. Uh, yeah, let's definitely do it again. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, bye-bye. Nice. Bye, Glenn. Obrigada. You know, he's from Brazil. we got to do that. Oh, my God. We just spoke to Omar, the Omar of journalism. 